Let's pray before we get into the word this afternoon. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that it goes out, it never returns void or empty, but it accomplishes that that you purpose it to do. Just as the dew waters the grass, Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for the empowering of this word in our lives, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So last week, this is part two of a two-part series, okay? Last week we looked at the authority of Jesus Christ. The uh, uh, Colossians said the supremacy of Christ Jesus. And if we do not understand the authority and the supremacy of Christ, we will never come into that for ourselves. You know, if you don't understand the authority of somebody, when they delegate your authority, you're never coming to the fullness of it because you don't understand their authority. Okay? So last week we looked at the authority and the supremacy of Christ. Colossians says, All things were made for him, by him, and through him, and he holds all things together. You know, the universe is not just rushing out of control. and spread. It's all in the remit of God as the creator of all things. Not one hair from our head drops to the floor without God knowing. Amen. Not one bird lands and dies without God knowing. And how much more important are you? And sometimes we can feel unimportant because of circumstances. You know, you see some people are just in the bless me club. Everything seems to go right for them. They're getting blessed, they're getting suddenly, they're getting this, they're getting that, got good health, and then you're sitting on this side saying, well, what have I done wrong? Where have I gone wrong? Am I under a curse? Has this happened? Do you know what we need sometimes is just to come into the full understanding of the authority of the believer. And we can understand the authority of the believer when we understand the authority of Christ Jesus. So if you missed last week, you can go online on the website or on YouTube and you can watch that. So last week we looked at the authority of Jesus Christ. We saw his supremacy over all creation. And that it's Jesus who possesses ultimate authority, including the authority to judge. I've said this many times, a lot of people say, oh, God is my judge, God is my judge. But in actual fact, Jesus is your judge. Jesus is actually your judge. An authority has been given to Jesus to judge. He is our king, and we live under the benefits of his kingship. We are seeking his authority as his believers, and we live under his delegated authority. So Jesus we understand his authority, but then Jesus has delegated his authority to his believers. Amen? So he hasn't just come with authority, done some stuff in authority, and moved in the power of the Spirit. He's also then left the Holy Spirit for us to walk in that same authority. It's a delegated authority. You know? And there are some things in life you need authority for. And if you don't have the authority, you're stuck. You can go this far, but you can't go any further because you need a greater level of authority. Amen? And so Jesus, uh, ascending back into heaven, then decides, you know what, I'm going to impart that authority onto my bride, onto the church. Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Not part authority, not a bit of authority, but all authority. And on this earth, there are people with different levels of authority. Now, if you take King Charles, or if we said the Queen, who we're probably more familiar with, she had authority. She had authority over this country, over the Commonwealth, over the Falkland Islands, so on and so forth. But she wasn't total authority, it's limited. Her sovereignty is limited, you know? And some people have authority at work, 
But it's not total authority, it's limited authority. But Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always and to the very end of the age. So that's the great commission uh, in uh, Matthew 28 and Mark 16. Mark 16. And it's an impartation of authority to go forward in the, the, the mandate of the vision of Christ Jesus. And we go forward in that mandate. So it's not under our own authority, it's his authority. And the thing what is lovely there, it says, and surely I am with you always. So he doesn't send us off and wave us goodbye and leave us to it. He goes with us. He is with us by his Holy Spirit in all that we're doing. Good day, bad day. He is with us. When it goes right, he's with us. When it goes wrong, he is with us. Amen? So we're not subject or left down our own. Mark 16, the Great Commission, and verse 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and they will drink deadly poisons and it will not harm them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God the Father. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his words by the signs that accompanied them. And again, there's an emphasis that the Lord worked with them. He did it with them. Years ago, lots of people used to say, Pastor, can we serve you? Can we serve you? Can we serve you? I'd say, no, no, you don't need to serve me. I need you to serve with me. Amen? There are a lot of people out there who just want to be served. You know? But they don't want to serve. And Jesus, is, Jesus had the authority because he was the greatest servant. And if you want authority, then you, there must be a level of accountability. There must be a level of commitment. You can't have authority over the people who work in Tesco's if you don't work in Tesco's. You can't have authority over somebody else's children because they belong to somebody else. And if you want authority in your own home, you've got to come under, under the authority of Christ. See, the wife is to obey the husband. It doesn't say in everything. You don't obey your husband in sin. Amen? It says, obey your husband as is fitting in the Lord. So when your husband is trying to get you to do something that is not godly or in fitting with the Lord, that's where there becomes a problem because the authority of Christ is superior. Now, I'm not saying don't obey your husbands, but I'm saying you've got to understand the authority in which that is. My wife submits to me as is fitting it says, as is fitting in the Lord. And the husband has to love his wife. Amen? Love her and treasure her and value her and build her up and appreciate her and cook for her and massage her feet and spend all, <laughs> all the women are going, yeah, preach it! <laughs> but we've got to love our wives. So, and then these things are confirmed by signs that accompany it. Amen? So delegated authority is not authority you have of your own. It is something that is given to you. Now, Caleb's just done his first week working for Kent Police. And now he's got his police roll number, and they've given him a nickname already in the police force. His nickname is Laptop. It gets better. They've nicknamed him Laptop. Do you know why? Because he's the smallest PC. 
Ah. But he will have, when he finishes his course as a police officer, he will have delegated authority. He doesn't stand there in his own name. He says, in the name of the law. Amen? Now, as, as humanity, we were under the law. We were under the authority of the law. And the, the priests in Israel would say, in the name of the law, we accuse you of X, Y, and Z. But Jesus comes along and he said, I've fulfilled the law now in the name of grace. Amen? In the name of grace. So there's delegated authority. It's not of our own, but it's submitting to the senior authority. So Caleb, as a police officer, will have to submit to those above him. And if he won't submit to those above him, guess what? He will have nobody that he will be in charge of below him because he won't submit to those above him. On, on a British passport, new wording because the Queen has gone, on a British passport it says, His Britannic Majesty's Sec Secretary of State requests in the name of his majesty, that all to who all who it may concern to allow the bearer to pass freely without let or hindrance, and to afford the bearer such assistance and protection as necessary. And that's the authority of the British passport. And it's on behalf of the king. Now, the king doesn't have to have a passport himself, but we do. And that passport, do you know really where that comes from? It comes from Nehemiah. When Nehemiah said to the king, can you give me letters to trans uh, and freighters and these different areas that they would let me pass through and they would give me the assistance that I need to rebuild the city wall. And so the king wrote to all these different kings and authorities and said, will you please allow Nehemiah to pass through your land and assist him? And that's probably the first ever passport as such. You know? But it wasn't his authority, it was delegated. See, and if we can understand, I'm not walking in my authority, it's not so that I'm so great, it's because he's so great. It's because of his supremacy. And yet I've been risen up to reign with Christ Jesus. In his supremacy, I reign with him. Not my supremacy, but his. And I've been adopted into the family. I've become an heir and a co-heir with Christ and his authority. See, and if we can really get our head around these things, oh man, we're walking a new level of freedom. We have to remember that we are citizens of heaven. And we are under God's authority, which is delegated. We are in the world, but we're not of it. Amen? Now, some people you meet, you think they're completely not of it at all. They're on a different planet altogether. But I'm not talking about the nuts, fruits and flakes who work for Cadbury's. I'm talking about us. We are in the world, but we are not of it. Now, there are laws and constitutions that we submit to which we should do according to the word. But there are also things in this world that we can supersede the authority they're at and say, well, I'm going to bypass that authority and I'm going to the Father. I'm going to go straight to the Father because his authority outranks this authority. And sometimes you go to the Father and the Father gives you favour. And he takes you past that authority that should have held you. But he takes you further because he has a great authority. Sometimes the answer is no, and you need to submit to that particular authority in the situation. You know, children do it. They do. Children do it. You know, your brothers fall out with, well, I'm telling mum. Well, I'm telling dad. I'm going to a greater authority than you. And sometimes in our prayer life, we, we need to understand it's really that simple. I'm going to tell Dad about this situation. I'm not happy. It's unfair. It's not just. It doesn't come into line with his character and his promises for me. So I'm, 
I'm having a tantrum and I'm going to tell my dad of you, and off we go. And when I was a kid, I used to do it because my dad was six foot nine and nearly 30 stone. It was a huge mound mountain. And when you're in the playground and kids fall out and say, my dad's bigger than your dad, I used to do that. And I'd say, but no, no, I mean, he really, really is bigger than your dad. It's huge. And so we have to remember the authority again that we're going to. And we're not of this world. That Some of the rules and regulations of humanity don't apply to us. I'm not of this world. That's a worldly order. And I'm of the kingdom of God. Amen? And so sometimes you've got to look at things and you've got to step back and say, well, hang on a minute, this doesn't apply to me. Jesus gave his authority to the, to the disciples to continue his work. Matthew 10, verse 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. We have that authority. And we need to move in that authority and we need to remember the authority we have. And you know what? Sometimes we get discouraged because you pray for someone or something and there doesn't seem to be an answer. Do you know what? That's not your responsibility. If you pray for Ricky and he don't get healed, it's not your fault. You're not a failure. You've just got to be obedient to what the Word of God says. Now, there could be a blockage for another reason. There could be a lack of faith somewhere. There could be the situation where Paul went to the Lord and three times he asked the Lord to take away the problem and the Lord allowed that problem to stay in place, which was probably an eyesight problem. But that's according to the Lord's will. But we shouldn't back off from praying for people for healing. We should always pray, always stir up the gift of faith that is within you and pray for one another to be healed. Jesus continues with his disciples. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely, freely you have received. Freely, freely give. I love the story of Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth, the great evangelist, recorded, raised 19 people from the dead. I struggle to get my son out of bed in the morning. 19 people. On one occasion, they've got the body in a coffin and they're having a wake and Smith goes in and he picks the body up out of the coffin and throws it against the wall and cries, live! And it did, after the third time of falling down. It life came back into that body. And think that's, wow, so amazing. Yet his daughter died as a young girl and he couldn't find the healing for her. His wife, Alice, died. I've been to his burial site and you'd think it would be some great big shrine. It's not, it's just a little tiny slab in Yorkshire. You know? But the thing is, we've just got to be faithful in the call. Just be faithful in the call. Trust God's authority. Peter, after Jesus had ascended, Peter and uh, moved in the authority that he was given. When Peter and John went to the temple, they saw the beggar, he was asking for money, and they looked at him and said, gold and silver, we have none, but such as we have, we give to you. And what I love here is the practical application. Acts chapter 3 uh, and verse 4, Peter looked straight at him, looks him in the eye, gets his attention. So the man gives him his attention, expecting to get something, and then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, 
So he's using the delegated authority. He's not saying in my name. He's saying in the name of the one that has authority, Jesus of Nazareth, in his name. Just as the police used to say, open up in the name of the law. Not open up in the name of Tony. It's no good. Tony used to have to say, open up in the name of the law. It's the police. And that's the authority. And they said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. And I love verse 7. Verse 7 says, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Verse 7 is crucial. They didn't just pray for healing and then walk away. He he then moves immediately by faith that this has happened and he helps him up immediately. Wonderful. That's, That's faith in action. That's the stirring of faith. So he doesn't just pray. There's an immediate application to the prayer request. And that's where faith comes in. Jesus gave the disciples the right to proclaim forgiveness. Forgiveness and salvation. John 20, verse 21. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. And he was talking about salvation. So suddenly, they've received the Holy Spirit, which is the empowering. That's the empowering. Do you know, a few years ago, I felt the Lord say to me this, this question is very, very challenging, and it's great for every believer to sometimes ask themselves. And I felt the Lord say to me, what do you believe about what you know? Because we know a lot of stuff about God. We know a lot of stuff about Scripture. We know a lot of stuff. But what do we believe about what we know? We know Jesus is this, that and the other, but what do we truly believe that he is? That it activates our faith and our confidence because I don't just know it, I believe it. It's, about, it's a bit like driving a car saying, I know with my head knowledge that if I put my foot on the brake, it should, the car should stop with my head knowledge. But until you actually do it, until you're driving 70 mile an hour down the motorway and you have to brake, you, you then put into practice your faith because you then hit the brake pedal and thank God you, you stop. Amen? What do you believe about what you know. And sometimes God will test you in that. Because you can confess, oh, I believe this, I believe that, I'm a superhero, I'm so full of faith. Sometimes situation comes along, now you're going to be tested in this. What do you really believe about the word of God? Jesus said, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? There's a lot of rumours around, but who do you say I am? And so with our faith walk, we have to know and believe. I know it says this can happen, and I believe it can happen as well. And we walk not by sight, but by faith. So a lot of people confessing that they walk by faith, but they're not walking by faith, they're walking by sight. And you're only making decisions based on what you can see, analyse, and work out all the pros and cons. The world does that every year on New Year's Eve. Everybody does that. That's not walking by faith. To walk by faith is to say, well, I don't know where to put my foot, but I'm going to step. And trust that you're going to uphold me. Now, don't put the Lord your God to a foolish test. Don't be stupid either. Okay? Don't be ridiculous. And your, your faith is exercised according to the word of God according to the character of God. The disciples were given the authority to proclaim judgment. Matthew 18, 18. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever is 
loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. And we've been given authority to move things on this earth according to the heavenly agenda and authority. And we can move in that authority because we've been given that authority. The amplified version explains it like this. Truly I tell you, whatever you forbid and declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be already forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit and declare proper and lawful on the earth must be already permitted in heaven. Amen? So we are declaring, when we bind and loose, we are declaring the heavenly authority and expectation. And there are some things that humanity, even the church, says is okay on earth, but if you were to stand before the Father, you would think twice about agreeing to some things, such as abortion, such as homosexuality, such as fornication, such as greed. Are these things permitted in heaven before the eyes of the Father? No, they're not permitted. Well, therefore, they're not permitted on the earth either because we come under his authority. A worldly authority is differently to heaven authority. Now, I'm not picking on anyone if you've had abortion. It's just a good example because abortion is legal in most countries on the earth. Does it, just because it's legal in the eyes of men does not mean that it's legal in the eyes of God. It's not legal in the eyes of God, just because it's legal in the eyes of men. And sometimes, us Christians, we get carried along with the world, and we think that's the standard that we operate on. We don't. We operate on a different standard, and it's his standard. You know? And my heart goes out to anyone who's had abortion or have been in a situation, anything like that. And God is a God of grace and love and restoration and forgiveness. Amen? And if anyone was a candidate to be aborted, that's me. Because I was the result of a rape. So I'm the perfect candidate to be aborted. Because I was born in the act of rape by a paedophile. That was my father, a rapist, committed suicide. But if my mother had aborted me, you just got rid of Luke. Well, what's he done wrong? Well, what did I do wrong? Nothing. What's he done wrong? A generation later, nothing. Caleb. I mean, he supports one football team, but, you know. Leah. You know? And we make a whole generation pay for something what was never to do with them, and we're wiping them out. The injustice of it. Rather, those women who feel trapped in that thing, we should come up with the solutions and support them and encourage them and help them and get alongside them. Amen? And there's grace and there's forgiveness. Our future authority, future authority, Corinthians 6 verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment? instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge the trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels how much more the things of this life? And we see an authority confirmed that you will judge the angels. And you're sitting there on a Monday morning with dog breath and depression and fed up and you think, I can't even do my shoelace up, let alone judge the angels. You know? But how you feel does not change the authority that God has given you. You might not feel very authoritative, but it doesn't change the fact God has given you authority. It's whether you choose to use it and apply the blood of Jesus because there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Whew. Wonderful. 
So you will judge the angels. What? Me? Yes. The heavenly realm. So God is saying you should have the wisdom to be able to judge the things in this life correctly if you're going to judge the angels. Revelation 20 verse 4 says this, I saw a throne on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast nor its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Amen? So we will judge the non-believer as well. This reign with Christ is called the thousand years or the millennia and it's a time in the future where Satan will be bound after the second coming of Christ, after Armageddon, Satan will be bound for a thousand years and have no authority on the earth. Wow. We see God's children are given a higher position even than the angelic realm because angels have not been redeemed by Christ, but you have. And some people say, well, angels aren't made in the image of Christ. Man is, and that's why we've been given more. Well, uh, it's not quite as clean cut as that because most of the times that the angels appeared in the Bible, they were mistaken as men. Scripture says you will entertain angels unaware so that angel is going to appear as a man or woman or whatever. Not Fluffy the cat, Liam. You know? It's not. But you, we are going to entertain angels and we're going to judge the angels. We will judge the demonic realm. They are held in captivity, waiting judgment. And Jesus has delegated judgment to you and one day you will sit and judge the demonic realm. So you're not very popular. Satan's not very keen on you. You'll be getting no Valentine request from Satan. All right? Why? Because to Satan it's a mockery. Satan didn't even feel that he should submit to the authority of God. He said, I will ascend myself above the stars of God, above God's throne, and I will put myself on the highest mount. And he's been brought down low. And now God's creation, man, who he tricked, is actually going to judge the demonic realm. Wow. Powerful stuff. Do you realize the authority you carry? The demons tremble when a man or woman of faith is in the situation because they know the authority that they are standing in. And there's a movement in the unseen world when a man or woman of faith begins to pray and prophesy, move in the things of God and let their faith be stirred. And there is a shaking that takes place. If anyone has a spirit of fear, it will be the demonic realm. Because Jesus said, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love. Wonderful. We know that angels are called to serve the saints who inherit eternal life. The angels will serve you. And already, even with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the angels come and tended him. After he was tempted in the desert, it says the angels come and tended him. And sometimes we, need just, we just need to say, Lord, send your ministering angels to refresh and tend me. We have authority. We have authority over ourselves. When King David was going into battle, it said that his knees were knocking together, shaking with fear. 
So what did he do? He rebuked his knees for shaking. I love it. I think it's fantastic. I mean, basically, he's saying that he was crapping himself. He was petrified. He didn't know what to do. He was breaking it. And the only thing in the end, he takes authority even over his physical body himself and he rebukes his knees for the fear manifesting. And sometimes we need to rebuke our mind. We need to rebuke our body. And we need to tell our mind and our body to come into line with the Word of God. That's what, not my, not my opinion, the Word of God. And this body here has been made in his image and in his likeness. So this body will come into line. Now sometimes it won't come into line because we keep stuffing cream cakes into it and it's going out of alignment. But you understand where I'm coming from. Why do people pray over really junk food and then expect it to change into something healthy? We do it as a family. We sit there before our McDonald's. Lord, bless this food to our body. Bless the, the hands that have prepared it while I stuff myself with this giant Big Mac and large fries. But because we feel guilty, we will then say, but I'm going to have a Diet Coke. As if that compensates for anything. It, Diet Coke don't compensate. You don't get off with having Diet Coke. The idea of judging angels comes from a Greek word called krino, which means to govern and strongly implies that we have authority over the holy angels as well. So we will judge the demonic fallen realm, but when we reign with Christ, we will rule over the angels. The demonic realm would have been done away with, judged, condemned. But now we're going to rule with and over the angels. That is your future job description, ruler of angels. See, sometimes we have a low self-confidence. But when we read our job description and our family heritage in the words, you can feel a confidence coming back in. You know? What do you do for a living of all the angels and the universe? Next. <laughs> you know? We've got to walk in the confidence God has given us. Walk in the authority that God has given us. The destiny of men and women is to be one day higher even than angels and to sit with Christ in judgment, which will greatly annoy Satan and his ambition to ascend above the stars of God. Hebrews. We have to, Hebrews talks about submitting to one another. We have to recognize the authority the authority that one another carry. And I'm not just talking about leader to leader, I'm talking about brother to brother, sister to sister. We can't just poo-poo each other because we carry a level of authority. So we have to respect one another. It doesn't say you've got to like one another. But we have got to love one another and we have got to respect one another. Amen? And there's a level of authority that we need to recognize, even from somebody who's a baby Christian and knows nothing of the word. Yeah, but they're a child of God now. They've got a new inheritance. They carry a new authority. It's just they don't know all the benefits that are coming their way. But the authority they carry is the same as yours. See, we're equal in authority in many ways. We're equal in uh, value we're just different in purpose. What, as you take a car, it's got a steering wheel and it's got a, a tyre. What's most important? Well, they're both equally important. You can't have one without the other. But they serve different purposes. And sometimes we recognise that in the kingdom, we serve different purposes. God has different things in mind for each of us to fulfil. Hebrews 13 verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders, submit to their authority, because they must keep watch over you as those who must give an account. 
not to browbeat people, not dictatorial rule over people, that men or women have to give an account to God. To God. With fear and trembling, with awe, reverence. That is how you carry leadership. Moses says, who am I to govern this great people of yours? And that's how leaders need to view the church, whether you lead a, a, a house group, whether you lead a church of tens, thousands, hundreds, whatever it is. It, it's the Lord's people. And you've got to love and respect that they belong to the Lord. And then those that we sit under authority to, it says, do this so that their work may be a joy and not a burden. Are you making your leader's work a joy? Are you a joy to your leader or are you a burden? Here we go again. Are you a joy or are you a burden? It says, do this so that you will be a joy and not a burden because that will be of no benefit to you. It doesn't say it will be of no benefit to them. You won't give them a headache. It says this will be of no benefit to you. So if those that I sit under authority in, if I'm not a joy and I'll become a burden to them, it's not that it's no benefit to them. It's no benefit to me to be like that. God's not going to bless me if I'm a burden to those who are above me. Now, if people are trying to lead you into sin or wrong teaching and stuff like that, that's a different kettle of fish. That's totally different. You know, we avoid sin, we avoid manipulation, we avoid all wrong teaching. Acts 10.42 says, He commands us, commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed as judge of the living and the dead. So what does the Christian have? Authority over. Well, we have authority over this, which we forget, the tongue. Authority over the tongue. Mara is so good. My wife is so good. She's not a reactionary. She never sh chucks out a quick comment. She never does it. And when we were first married, I used to say, come on, say something, tell me how you really feel. And she was so self-controlled. Because she never did. And she said, you know what, I never will say things I regret. She's so good in that area. She did used to physically beat me instead, though, I must say. Not with <laughs> I'm joking. But we have authority over the tongue. We have authority over the mind. And sometimes, you know, that, the mind is a battlefield. And sometimes you've got to take real authority over the mind. Because the mind then begins to affect the heart. Something gets in your mind. Mike don't like me. Why don't he like me? He didn't say hello last week. Did I say hello to him? No, don't matter. He don't like me though. And then as time goes on, I make more of that. No, the next week he hates me. The next week it's this, it's bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden Mike comes up to say hello to me and I just like, oh yeah, sort off. Because I've built something up in my heart already. It's not the case, it loves me. But do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes you've got to take authority over the mind. When thoughts come into your mind, Scripture says, taking every thought captive. It doesn't say rebuking it. The church is running man, rebuking, 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 yet the Word of God says, take it captive. When David took them captive, he didn't rebuke them on a hillside and send them packing. He took them captive. They became prisoners. They were then judged and they were then punished. So when those thoughts come into the mind of the believer, we say, is this thought right? Is it true? Is it from God? No. Therefore, I strip it of all of its authority in the name of Jesus. I cover my mind and my emotions with the blood of Jesus. I refuse to accept this thought in Jesus' name. I judge it to be wrong and of the enemy and I will not have it. I stand and I walk on the word of God in Jesus' name. That's a lot more than just saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And then immediately you go out the door and you've still got the thought in your head. He said, take it captive. 
that is to rule over it, to take it captive. We have authority over sickness and disease. Like I said a few weeks ago, Ramara, she's had this uh, brain operation to remove this tumour. She's got a big lump on her head. It's all filled with fluid. They said, 10 days, that'll be gone. It was like six weeks, and it's like getting bigger. She's concerned. And one night I was in bed, and I was just reminded of our authority. And while she was asleep, I just laid hands on her, and I took that thing captive. She woke up in the morning completely gone. Completely gone. Wonderful. We have authority over the demonic realm. The enemy will attack your mind. He will. The demonic realm will attack your thought patterns. But you have authority. Amen? They have been called low. You have authority over the natural realm. Now, unfortunately, you're not going to walk outside and go, let it be summer. You know, it's not going to happen. Otherwise, I would have done it already. But we have authority over the natural realm as well. We have authority over the animals. The first thing Adam was given authority over was what? The animals. He was told to rule over them, to govern them, that they must come under his authority, including my dog and the cat. The dog crept in my room last night. My was doing night work. He crept in, he got on the bed. And I'm pretending to be asleep and I can see him there and he's walking up and up. When I went to bed, I had an apple and I put the apple core on the bedside table and he's crept really gently. I've got one eye open, Diego, and I can see him. He's looking at me with one eye. He moves over and the apple core's down there and he's like, he's looking at me. He's like, and he's gone out of the room. Bless him. And we have authority over the mind. We have authority to forgive. Hey, a lot of people say, I just can't forgive. Yes, you can. Forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is not saying what that person done is okay. No, that person, what they done, it was wrong, it was sin. They should never have done it but I choose not to hold it against them. I release them from it. I release them from any judgment over that situation because I've forgiven them. Now, it doesn't mean to say what they did was right. It wasn't right. It was wrong. It was always wrong. But you have forgiven them. As for me, I stand with the Lord. I forgive them. Joseph said, am I to stand in the place of God? I'm not. I have no choice but to forgive them. Doesn't mean to say you've got to trust them. Doesn't mean to say you've got to start hanging around with them, but you've got to forgive them. And there's this, there was probably in the 80s, this theology went round and round the churches. It's partly true. And it was, well, forgiveness is not about them. It's about you. Because unforgiveness keeps you in captivity and it keeps you in bondage. But if you really think about a pure heart, it's wrong because you're, you're forgiving them because it's going to benefit you. You're forgiving them because you don't want to be held captive. So you say, yeah, 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 forgiveness is holding me back. I'm bitter, I'm this, that and that. Well, I choose to forgive them then. That's not true forgiveness. No. You're forgiving them because you're getting something out of it. That's not purity. Purity is to say, whether I get anything out of this or not, if my circumstances remain the same, I choose to forgive them. Even though my circumstances may keep me bound, I choose to forgive them. This thing about, oh, if you don't forgive, you're in bondage. So, in actual fact, when you're forgiving somebody, you're loving yourself. That is a warped, warped way of thinking in reality. That is not the purity. If you stand before the Father and say, with a pure heart, Father, I forgive them. They look at you and say, no, 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 no. You're doing it because you want blessings and you think because you haven't forgiven them, it's preventing the blessing or something coming your way or whatever. That is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is to say, I forgive them irrespective. 
Doesn't mean say you've got all mushy feelings towards them and you want to send them a lovely card. No. I, it was wrong. But I forgive them irrespective and I walk away. We have to be careful because these subtle little things can come in and you know what? If we're not forgiving out of purity, we're still in bondage. You know? So we have to be careful. But we have the authority to forgive sin, especially those in our lives. We have our authority over every weapon forged against us. Amen? Every weapon forged against you, you have authority over it. There's a program, I don't know on your TV, but on my TV, it's channel 56. And it's called Forged in the Fire. And it is the only TV show that I follow and watch. And it's about blacksmiths. And it's a competition. And they have to make swords and weaponry and all this different stuff. And there's four of them in the competition. And they get a limited amount of time, three hours to make a sword. And then once they've made it, it's tested. One, they check to see, is it straight? And then they smack it over a bit of wood to see if it'll break. Is it strong? And then they use it to cut to see if it will fulfill its purpose. And then at the end of it, they say, well done, your blade will do the job or whatever. And you end up with two of them in the final and the winner wins £10,000. I'm sad because I watch it all the time. I love it, forged in the fire. I've got Mara watching it as well now. Honest, it's great. But the fire is uh, any weapon forged against you. That's when people have malice towards you and they're in the background working out your demise, your downfall, uh, some way of getting to you, getting you down, stripping you down, whatever. And you have authority over every weapon forged in the fire with intent against you. We have authority over every weapon forged in the fire. In closing, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is God-breathed, means out of the mouth of, the very breath of God, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Don't you want to sit there and say, do you know what? I am thoroughly equipped to serve my king. King David, David was a shepherd boy. He had no training in the battlefield, yet he was thoroughly equipped. Why? Because he'd fought a lion and he'd fought a bear looking after the sheep. And he learned how to fight. And sometimes we think we're not equipped for some of the spiritual things that lay ahead of us. But we are equipped. And Scripture says you use the Word of God so that you would be thoroughly equipped, really equipped well. Arsenal, God's favourite football team. Confirmation, brother. Thank you for that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Arsenal, which is God's favourite football team. Uh, do you know, Queen Elizabeth, the only football team she ever invited to the Buckingham Palace was Arsenal. They got done for shoplifting afterwards, but that's not the point. No, but she, she invited them to Buckingham Palace, Arsenal Football Club. But do you know what? That football team are brilliant. They're top of the league, but yet they're still looking to buy more players because they want to be thoroughly equipped to do the job, which is to win the title. Thoroughly equipped. I want to be thoroughly equipped to serve my king. And I'm going to train myself. And I'm going to ready myself. And I'm going to do the exercises I need to do so that if he calls on me, he ain't got to wait for me to get ready. They say, oh, you're not ready, you're not ready, you're not ready, you're not ready, you're not ready. But, oh, there's no one, oh, you're ready, come on. I want God to look down and say, you're ready, let's go. I want to be thoroughly equipped. To be thoroughly equipped, the believer has to know the authority that they have. Amen? It's not a selfish authority. 
It's authority given by Jesus. In closing, if all scripture has been breathed by God and is authoritative over how we ought to live, we come under the authority of God's word. And if we truly understand the authority of Christ and the imputed authority of the believer, then we would speak different, act different, live different, and we would get different results if we truly believe the authority. We would, without doubt, encounter a greater sense of victory in our lives and a greater sense of purpose with a greater sense of union with Jesus and a greater understanding of his word. Amen? Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus. I thank you, Father, that you purchased, purchased us, men and women, from every tribe and every nation and every tongue to be a kingdom of priests before our God. I thank you, Father, that we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus, that we have authority imputed to us because we are the blood-washed. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that each one of us moving forward would have a greater understanding of the authority of Christ which is far more than just a wishing and a hoping. I pray, Father, that each one of us would understand the authority that we have as believers, that we are co-heirs with Christ, that we will rule the nations, that we will judge the angels, that we will judge the demonic realm, that you have called us to rule and reign with you, and that we have authority on this earth to fulfill your will according to your desires, Lord God. Father, I pray for everyone here present that they would rise up this year in a new level of authority, knowing who they are in Christ, knowing that we cannot earn by any measure a sense of authority. It is the grace of God to the believer and it is the right of our inheritance as children of God that we have authority. We can't earn it, we don't deserve it, but we have it. And I pray, Father, just like a master swordsman, as he yields that sword, we would yield that authority correctly, wisely, lovingly over our lives, the lives of those that we love and even the lives of the unbeliever. Because even the unbelievers looked and said, what authority does this man, Jesus, have that even the wind and the storms obey him? Wow. Father, let that authority sit on each one of us Father, I ask that you would put us under a fresh anointing, Lord God, that you would equip us for where we are going and that we would be willing to go. Give us authority in our personal lives that leads to holiness. Our bad habits we don't have to have, but you called us to be holy as you are holy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.